a lot of people have showed up. Uh, so I'm just going to start. Uh, so yeah, welcome everyone to uh, our MEDAS workshop. So this type of topic is going to be the construction stage analysis for uh, post-tensioning structures. Uh, and we're inviting our MEDAS expert, Daniel Baxter, with us uh, today. Uh, so I'm going to do a brief introduction of him. But of course, uh, he can introduce himself better. Uh, so I'll hand over to his presentation soon. Uh, but yeah, he's a senior bridge engineer and bridge department manager at Michael Baker International. Uh, he has uh, experience including uh, focus on pre-stressed and post-tension concrete bridges and arc bridges, uh, steel truss bridges, and three-dimensional final element modeling. Uh, he's also an NHI instructor and teach the NHI superstructure, steel, uh, steel curved girder substructure, and load rating uh, courses. So uh, his specialties are pre-stressed and post-tension concrete bridges, uh, arch bridges, steel truss bridges, and three-dimensional final element uh, modeling. So before we jump into uh, Daniel Baxter's presentation, uh, I just want to uh, do a little, in, little introduction of the Metis Expert Network. So like Daniel Baxter, uh, a lot of other uh, professional engineers are, uh, are Metis Expert and they're within the network. Uh, so uh, we do uh, have this network because we want to connect with our users and for the users to uh, you know, forge a better community to help out each other. Uh, so in this, network, you can, you know, join webinar, uh, Q&A session, one-to-one uh, -one consultation, and in the future, we'll plan to have conferences. Uh, and uh, meanwhile, we have expert uh, tips and tricks of how to use the software. Uh, we also have more learning tutorials and many more. So again, this is uh, completely free. Uh, we want to, uh, you know, have a better user community. And all you have to do is to go to this website. Uh, fill out the form and we will contact you shortly. So without further ado, uh, I'll hand over the presentation right to uh, Daniel. Let me do that right now. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Show screen. Can you see, uh, can you see my presentation? Yeah, I do. Okay. Oh, well, thanks everyone for tuning in and th thanks for the introduction. I'm out of the uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota office of Michael Baker International. Uh, we opened it in uh, 2014, and it's it's nice to see it grow. Now in 2020, we have a nice, uh, nicely sized bridge group here, as long as well as a, a roadway group and a traffic group now. Uh, so what I thought I'd do uh, with this workshop, uh, might have asked if I'd uh, you know do this workshop about stage post tension concrete analysis is. Uh, provide some background for uh, what I think of as an oldie but a goodie. Uh, this uh, post tension concrete arch design I, I worked on back in actually the last decade. It's been a little while, but it does have, you know, a fair amount. Uh, it has a lot of post tension construction staging. So hopefully uh, that this should be uh, helpful to people. So I thought the structure of the workshop that uh, will follow is I'm just going to start with the presentation. It's not super long, uh, just to give some overview of the project so that then uh, the scene makes sense. And then uh, I thought I'd show the uh, cut load and post tensioning uh, MIDAS model uh, that was used for the analysis and uh, go through and just, just show everyone how, how it's set up. And then hopefully there'll be uh, time for questions. So if people have questions, that's great. I mean, this, as this is a workshop, I was thinking this would be fairly informal and people could ask, could ask questions about things as, uh, as much as they wish. Uh, so let's get started here. Uh, so the, the bridge I'll be uh, talking about and showing the model for is Fulton Road Bridge, and it's in Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, so let's just start talking a little bit about the background, just a brief at talk about bridge type selection, and then uh, talk about design and construction a little bit, as well as uh, the MIDA civil analysis, and then uh, exit the presentation. And I'll open up the uh, the dead load model and walk everyone through just how how we set up things in there with the model. So no no slides for for that portion of the workshop. Just to keep things informal, so folks can ask questions at that point. Uh, so uh, this bridge is located uh, almost due south of downtown Cleveland, uh, along the interstate along Interstate 71, which connects the airport to downtown Cleveland. So next time you fly into Cleveland, if uh, driving towards downtown and you look off to the right, you'll be able to see this bridge. Uh, it's 
So there's I-71, uh, and it crosses over a uh, river, uh, well, I guess it's a creek, uh, creek ravine uh, that has two sets of railroad tracks in it and also is right in the middle of the Cleveland Metro Park Zoo. Because it's in the middle of the zoo, it's a pretty high-profile location in the city for people to see. Uh, now, this bridge uh, also it replaced an existing concrete arch bridge that was built in 1932 and in pretty poor shape. Uh, but it was really it was really important to the community uh, to have this bridge here, and to, it was an important feature of the zoo. Uh, so when it became obvious that this that the original uh, 1930 structure needed to be replaced, uh, there was a lot of emphasis placed on um, creating a new arch bridge in its place. Uh, at the time this project was designed, I was in Michael Baker's uh, Cleveland, Ohio office. Started there and I uh, was there from 2004 to uh, 2014. So I was, I was fortunate enough to be able to work on the design for this bridge, and uh, it was a lot of fun. Uh, so here's a little bit about the uh, original structure that the uh, the new bridge replaced. Uh, cast in place, concrete open spandrel deck arch bridge opened in 1932 uh, with six 210-foot arch spans and four arch ribs. As well as roadway traffic, it also carried streetcars and uh, spanned over those railroad tracks and had these nice decorative railings and uh, sidewalk overhangs uh, as well. But uh, time was not kind to this bridge. It uh, had, uh, due to deterioration, those decorative railings and, and sidewalk overhangs were removed to the point so that uh, up tells so that the bridge looked like this for, I would say, you know, probably about the last decade or so of its existence. I was taken to look at it when I uh, came to Cleveland back in 2003 for my job interview, and I, I don't think I'd ever seen quite as the deteriorated bridge as this one. I'm, it, some uh, some of the, uh, you can't see in these photos, but some of the transverse uh, bracing elements between the arch ribs had just, all the concrete had crumbled away so that all there was was a, a rusting steel rebar cage where there used to be a full reinforced concrete member. Uh, so part of the structure type uh, process, which um, Michael Baker International, uh, that, that was in our, our, our scope of work for all uh, structure type selection, preliminary design, as well as final design. Uh, personally, I got involved with uh, final design. Uh, but the structure type selection uh, was uh, the, the finalists, you could say, were a Temporary precast deck arch, a more traditional uh, precast deck arch, or a concrete delta frame. Uh, the selected alternative was the uh, contemporary uh, precast deck arch structure, so keeping that arch like appear arch appearance of the original bridge, but making it look a little more modern. Uh, so you can see on the, uh, the rendering here is uh, the upper photo, and then the lower photo is how the new bridge actually look. So uh, I feel like we, we got pretty darn close to uh, ma matching the rendering in, in real life, which was which was nice to see. Even complete with the, the railing there. Uh, so let's let's talk a little bit about the design. Uh, the replacement structure uh, has, like the original did, uh, six arch spans and uh, uh, three uh, uh, just even approach spans on one end and uh, two on the other. And each arch span is uh, 210 feet long. They're they're all identical to one another, but uh, the, the pier bases that the arches rest on have uh, varying heights, and some of them are uh, are pretty tall as well. And it's also, uh, in terms of its expansion joints, it's continuous from end to end. The the superstructure uh, floats on the spandrel columns with a combination of uh, Teflon and elastomeric bearings. And the goal with that was to just keep all of uh, water runoff off of uh, the concrete. That's uh, that's a big factor of what did in the existing bridge. So our you know our thought was to just avoid all expansion joints and you know keep like salt you know infested water from uh, the winter off of the bridge and hopefully have a, a nice uh, you know long life for uh, the new bridge. So as I mentioned, the uh, the superstructure floats on top of the arch span. It's uh, comprised out of just standard uh, pre-stressed concrete uh, I-beams, and they're modular joints at the abutment since the expansion length is uh, fairly long uh, until you get to the abutments. And then the uh, water just drains off the structure 
uh, using the bike lanes, which are fairly wide. Uh, here's a, a cross section of the bridge, so you can see there are four traffic lanes, a, a bike lane on each side, and uh, fairly wide sidewalks. Uh, the arches for ease of construction are precast, and I'll talk about soon post tension together. There, there are four arch lines, and uh, the uh, the spandrel frames consisting of the spandrel columns and the uh, cat beams, uh, those are cast in place. Uh, we looked at precasting those, but since they're all kind of different heights with the, the roadway geometry, we thought the contractor agreed that'd be easier to cast those in place. So that's the configuration of the bridge. And, uh, and so let's take a look at the uh, layout of each arch span. So uh, each uh, arch span is comprised of three, uh, three precast arch segments, and then there'd be you know, four of these per span, since there are four arch lines uh, that are connected together with cast-in-place closure pores. And in turn, uh, these arch segments are then set on these uh, cast-in-place uh, pier bases here. And there are, uh, there are two types of arch segments. Uh, there's the end segment type, uh, which so there are two of those uh, per arch per span, and then the crown segment, which uh, obviously goes on the crown. And so that, uh, you know, that allowed us to have only uh, two of these uh, unique uh, precast elements for the arch, and also then allowed for you know cast-in-place construction to be used uh, for the thrust blocks uh, or these pier bases where everyone is is unique because of the varying heights. And just like the original bridge, each arch span each arch span has a a spans 210 feet uh, between center lines of the piers. You may be asking yourself, uh, well, why uh, why use post tensioning uh, in in arch structures since they're they're typically compression elements? They're just thought of as uh, compression elements. Uh, now, for this bridge, however, the uh, the combination of the arch sitting um, of the arch being founded on these tall piers, which have a fair amount of flexibility to them. And the widely spaced spandrel columns that then introduce significant concentrated loads uh, at just you know four locations on the arch, which is uh, different than a traditional arch where you have closely spaced spandrel columns, so the loading is a lot more uniform. Uh, these two factors just create a lot more bending in the arches than what one would think of with as a uh, traditional arch. Uh, just to step through this bending uh, moment diagram, we just during the design process wanted to understand. Uh, why we were seeing these higher moments. So we started with just a very basic uh, like arch that was on like fully uh, rigid supports and then made those uh, and introduced the, the flexibility of the actual supports and then uh, of the actual columns and then introduced in this which is uh, reflected with uh, the uh, the green moment diagram right here. And then uh, introduce the actual uh, the columns plus the flexibility of the foundations modeled with foundation springs in Midas Civil, which then gives a, this gold line here. So you can see in comparison uh, with where of an arch with a lot greater fixity and rigidity at the spring lines that there would be a lot less uh, moment in more traditional arch like that as you'd expect versus what we actually have where we have an arch on tall piers with this flexibility in the foundation. So uh, because of that, uh, when you look at stresses in the arch rib, it, 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 it acts more like a like a beam than you, you think of with a traditional arch. And using these precast uh, components, we, we wanted to be sure that they were uh, meeting the uh, ASHTA requirements for uh, service limit stresses. And if we look at the uh, the stress, uh, the state of stress in the arch with, uh, and these are service level stresses without any post tensioning uh, applied. Uh, there are there are a few regions where uh, the stress exceeded those limits, uh, particularly near where the uh, end segments meet uh, the, the cast in place pier bases at, at the thrust blocks. Uh, that that's a region where the uh, service level stresses uh, exceeded the limit pretty significantly, and also. At some locations, depending on the live load, 
under the intermediate spandrel columns, particularly the two spandrel columns in the middle, because uh, again, uh, this arch uses uh, a lot of fewer spandrel columns than our traditional arch would, so you have larger concentrated loads being introduced than is typical for an arch, which uh, then gives more bending. Uh, so, in order to meet uh, those stress limits, we uh, our, our design elected uh, to we ended up uh, post tensioning the arch ribs. Uh, which isn't uh, super common, but it, it has been done for other projects. Uh, but once the uh, decision was made to post tension those arch ribs, uh, then that, uh, that that has some additional challenges in that these arches have fixed ends to them. And if you're uh, trying to use eccentric post tensioning to counteract bending moments, uh, those fixed ends uh, give so much restraint that the secondary moments from that restraint we found just pretty much cancel out any beneficial primary pre-stress moment you'd get from using eccentric post-tensioning. So what we did to get around that was to use a step construction sequence where that eccentric post-tensioning is introduced uh, in a structure during a structural configuration that doesn't have the full rigidity of uh, the completed arch. And because it doesn't have that full rigidity, uh, then the uh, it's able uh, the segment's able to deform due to the eccentric pre-stress force and to to lock in that beneficial primary pre-stress moment to counteract the applied uh, bending moment. So it goes through how this post-tensioning sequence works for each arch span. So we start uh, uh, by completing the cast-in-place thrust blocks. Uh, then uh, the end segments are uh, erected on temporary towers, and uh, each uh, both, both segments are identical. The end segments are identical, and then there's one crown segment. Uh, then in the next step, uh, the closure pores are cast between the end segments and uh, the thrust blocks. And uh, these uh, two 19-strand post-tensioning tendons are then stressed uh, one, one on each side. And these 19-strand uh, tendons uh, have, are eccentric tendons. They have an eccentricity to them. And that eccentricity allows them to impart a beneficial uh, primary pre-stress moment into the arch rib to counteract those uh, Ending moments coming in uh, from the, the superstructure. Uh, and because at the time this pre stress force is introduced, uh, the, the arch hasn't been closed, there's a, there's a lot more flexibility in just the system of the arch rib be, uh, being supported by this temporary tower plus this thrust block, so it's able to uh, deform due to this pre stressing force and, and lock in the primary pre stress moment, which we want. Uh, then in the next step, uh, two 19-strand uh, eccentric tendons are stressed in the crown segment uh, before that segment is set on the towers so that uh, the, uh, the post-tensioning uh, operations can take place uh, without running into uh, clearance issues with the end segment. So those tendons are, are stressed on the ground. And I should mention that the end segments, they were stressed uh, from the ends of the thrust block. You can see the tendons in the diagram going through there. Uh, then the crown segments are erected. Uh, the uh, closure pores are placed uh, between the uh, crown segment and the end segments. The duct uh, connections are made for the uh, post-tensioning ducts. And then uh, the, the towers are removed. Uh, but then the final step is to then stress four 15-strand uh, tendons for arch for continuity uh, from end to end. And these tendons have a symmetric configuration. There's one in each corner. Uh, so they, they, they just sort of pull the arch down and compress it against itself uh, to get a, just a bunch of axial compression into the system, uh, but they don't add any uh, they don't add any pre stress moment because there's no uh, net eccentricity for these tendons. So then, if we look at service uh, level stresses, stress level plus live load with the post tensioning included, there's a lot more uh, a lot more axial compression, so we're far away from exceeding our uh, maximum tensile stress and can, can make use of uh, beneficial uh, axial compression to uh, resist bending. Uh, the superstructure had its own interesting uh, design considerations here uh, because we are using a uh, continuous superstructure where we have uh, like full continuity made between uh, the uh, pre-stressed concrete beams, so, you know, with a full diaphragm so that, so that it can slide and not have expansion joints. Uh, that means we have a continuous structure, we have a continuous span over each arch span, and uh, the support displacements at, at the crown are, are, are a lot large, are larger because of the flexibility of the arch than they are at the end. Uh, so that 
imparts additional bending moment in the superstructure versus if uh, each uh, support of the superstructure were equally rigid, like if it was just a, a viaduct of the same span supported on piers. So if you look at the uh, moment diagram here, uh, the uh, this, this this darker gray line here uh, that that represents uh, the net moment in each uh, superstruct in, in the superstructure span from one end of the arch span to the other. Whereas you can see just because of support displacements, including creep of the arch uh, creeping downward under the under the just sustained load of the post tensioning that creates additional support displacement. Uh, so then you have this increased moment. Uh, that we needed to uh, design for as part of this project to make sure the the beams that continue. Uh, so, to uh, you're you're at a uh, Midas workshop, so it's probably no surprise uh, that we use Midas Civil Software to uh, design this bridge, and we uh, use three different models. Uh, the uh, the superstructure configuration uh, was simple enough that we could just use the lever rule to distribute load to each individual arch line, which allowed us to on design, do the dead load, post tensioning, and live load design for the arches and the superstructure uh, using 2E models, which simplified things in terms of time versus making a 3D model. So we had three different models uh, that we used for the analysis. Uh, the first was a, a 2D arch line model uh, for dead load and post tensioning effects with construction staging included. We, we used a a pretty uh, pretty detailed uh, construction stage analysis to make sure we were, you know, capturing all the uh, creep shrinkage and pre-stressing loss effects uh, we needed to catch, which uh, Midas was able to analyze for us. Uh, then we used a separate uh, 2D model for live load that included the continuous superstructure spans, where the goal of this model uh, was to find to determine live load design forces to the arches and also to determine that additional bending moment in the pre-stressed concrete beam superstructure due to the flexibility of the arches. Uh, so that was our second model. And then we had a third uh, 3D static model that we used for uh, wind loading on the arches, spandrel columns, caps, and, and piers, not shown in the slide. So then uh, we, we, were just, uh, using, we were just using these models to determine design forces. Uh, so we, we output these uh, design forces from the model into post-processing spreadsheets to do our service and strength limit state uh, design checks. Uh, we did a full construction stage analysis uh, during construction with uh, construction loading and you know, creep and shrinkage and pre-stress loss effects, as well as an analysis of the final conditioning at opening day, as well as at day 10,000, where day 10,000 is so traditionally the final time that's used uh, for considering uh, consideration of losses in pre-stress time structures. So we just had our own spreadsheet for that. Uh, well, yeah, I mentioned this is an oldie but a goodie. Uh, this project <laughs> this project was kind of old. The bid was in uh, 2006. Low bid was under the engineer's estimate, uh, which we were relieved by because this was a, a time when uh, there was a, a pretty significant escalation in construction costs going in going on as the economy was humming. Uh, just a few highlights from construction I wanted to show to just help help people understand the design better. Uh, probably the most complex element of the bridge uh, are the thrust blocks, where we have these overlapping uh, post-tensioning tendons, both those in-span eccentric tendons and the four continuity tendons. They overlap from each span in the uh, in these thrust blocks, so uh, integrated, you know, Top drawings and like 3D drafting was used to make sure uh, that we didn't have any reinforcing conflicts uh, in these regions. You can see uh, you can see this is what they looked like when they were getting built. Uh, there was a bit of a learning curve as you might expect to, uh, to construct these, but they, they got the hang of it pretty quickly. Um, you can see our overlapping post tensioning ducts. Uh, so here's uh, here's how they look. Uh, how uh, some of those thrust blocks looked as uh, after they the concrete was cast. You can see the uh, anchorages for the post tensioning. Uh, and then the view of uh, the uh, crown segment under uh, fabrication. Those were these were done in car concrete in West Virginia, and again there were two uh, different unique shapes. And they they have voids that uh, were made with uh, just styrofoam blocks. Uh, the 
each segment was then erected on the temporary towers uh, using a like 67 ton crane so pretty pretty large crane we had there uh their temporary supports got it uh pretty creative over the railroad in our uh, design documents we did show an option where these uh to show it was feasible to uh, erect this using uh, temporary tiebacks to support the end segments if the, the, in case the railroad didn't allow uh, for this type of shoring to be placed over their tracks, but the, the contractor was able to negotiate this with them. So uh, as that I think was a little simpler than, than using tiebacks would have been. So here you can see a span where uh, the end segments have been placed on temporary supports and they're working on the, the closure core there between the bottom of the end segment and uh, rust plot. Uh, we uh, we used uh, one foot six inch closure pours. Uh, they were still a little congested, but that seemed like a, a better idea than uh, just a one foot closure pour to provide a little more room to work. These closure pours, again, that's where the ducts uh, for the post tensioning are connected together. Uh, and there's a fair amount of mild steel, too. Here's some views of the post tensioning operations going on at the uh, rust blocks. Uh, the dead end of the uh, end segment tendons was uh, where they connect uh, to the crown segment. At, so this uh, this allowed for uh, the live end to be at the base of the rust block, which I think made uh, construction access a lot a lot easier than it would be if it was up in the air. Uh, for the stressing operations, a nice view of the uh, uh, pre-stress of the superstructure under construction. You can see the Girders have been erected in the span, and they're working on uh, placing the you know, the canal the uh, sidewalk forms. Taking their uh, Alaska American Teflon sliding bear bearings to let the superstructure move. These are uh, decorative railing, and uh, when the original bridge was opened in uh, 1932, there, you know, it was the, the middle of the depression, but it, it gave people a, uh, an excuse to celebrate and. There's a, a photo of a beer wagon that was taken across the original bridge at the time it was opened. Uh, th this bridge was opened all the way back in, in, in 2010. Uh, there was a, a fun run that took place the following year. Uh, a friend of mine I'd never run before convinced me to participate in it. So he was like, you got to do this. You helped design the bridge. So I did and then got bitten by the running bug. So now it's like I run almost every day uh, for what that's worth. And uh, so that's just kind of a nice personal bonus from this project. Uh, part of the ribbon cutting, uh, the uh, there was a classic car parade. Here's a kind of fun photo. There's the photo. The photo on the left is uh, the original engineer, the engineers of the original structure, short, uh, I think shortly before it was opened. And then on the right is the are the folks who uh, Baker who designed the new bridge, Jeff Broadwater in the middle with the ties, the engineer record. Uh, I'm second from the left there with a little more hair than I have now. Uh, so that's uh, that, that's a little overview of the the bridge itself. So uh, now I am going to share the model and uh, the deadline model, and we can just get into the, how to set up. Uh, okay, so can, can you see uh, can you see my uh, Midas model here? Yeah, yeah, I'm able to see it. Okay, okay, great. So, so I understand from Midas that people uh that the goal here is to get a little more familiar with uh, how to set up uh stage post tensioning so uh that's that's what I'll focus on here so um, and as I think you can tell from the presentation uh there are you, you know there are a lot of you know there's there's set, different sets of tendons in each span so if we just if we look at span three right here. display maybe it's easier to see it if I go to the side view here let's take a look at the different tending groups uh, that are defined in the program so these are all defined using different tendon profiles we'll, I'll look at that in a second well we'll, here's uh here's the like uh, one of the eccentric end segment tendons because remember there are two of them so uh, they're, they're offset from one another we could we could turn off a little bit to yeah I think it's do that. Let me zoom in again. Uh, so there's our, our end segment tendon for span three. Then here's the here's one of the uh, the other opposite end segment tendon. Again, again, there are two of these, but the 
the tendon profiles are defined to, to put the tendon at the correct geometry and have it pass through the uh, thrust blocks in the correct way. Uh, here's one of the uh, eccentric ground segment tendons that I discussed. And then uh, uh, here are the span 3, C, T1, T2, T3, and T4 are all of the, uh, uh, these are the uh, continuity tendons that go from end to end of each span. So uh, let, let's look at how, uh, I think there's no really set order that you have to uh, create all these elements in in Midas. Uh, you know, different people have different preferences. Uh, one uh, thing you can do here is to, so let, let's take a look at the, uh, the properties. So it, you can, uh, it, if you look under uh, your loads tab here, let me cancel out. If you go to temp three stress loads, uh, that's where you'll find uh, your your ability to define tendons. Uh, you also need to define the tendon property. We'll look at that in a second. Um, but here's where the uh, here's where you would define a tendon profile, just under load temp pre stress tendon profile. So take a look at how those uh, how that defini def definition works. Uh, so here's how that uh, tendon is defined, and all the different ones. Uh, they're just uh, they're just defined. I mean, there are different ways to do this. Uh, we just define them just using coordinates, just x, y, z coordinates. So we figured out what these coordinates should be, uh, you know, just from the geometry of the bridge and using a spreadsheet. And then you can define in the model where uh, the profile insertion point is, so where uh, where the tendon begins and ends. Uh, this is 3D, and then uh, a couple. Uh, important aspects of adding and modifying a, a tendon are at the top of the tendon profile window here. Uh, you need to uh, assign each tendon to a group of tendons that uh, that goes into the construction staging and the loading. You also need to assign a tendon property uh, to your tendon profile, and you also need to assign uh, what uh, elements in the MIDAS model see the force from the tendon, so that that's a, an important aspect of this too. And then you want to name the tendon something uh, logical that you you can uh, remember to activate it when it needs to be activated. So that's uh, that's how a sample tendon is defined. Uh, so then let's look at the tendon property. These are uh, these eccentric ones. Uh, tendons are. Uh, uh, are 19 strand tendons. So uh, if we look at the property here, you just you can define uh, as many different uh, tendon properties as you need uh, to just based on just based on uh, how how many different number of strand tendons you have. Uh, just this total tendon area, you find that just by multiplying the area of uh, each strand um, by the, the total uh, number of strands. So uh, should be 0.217 for uh, 0.6 inch strands times uh, times 19, and uh, then you define your duct di diameter, your relaxation properties, the ultimate and yield strength of the tendon, uh, your uh, friction and wobble factors, and whether uh, you have a bonded tendon or not, either bonded or non unbonded tendons, and then uh, your uh, anchor set uh, at the beginning and the end, right there. So. Uh, you need to define as many different tendon properties as there would be, you know, differences in your your post tensioning tendons, and then you just assign them again in uh, at the uh, top of your uh, top of your tendon profile, right there. There's our tendon property and our, our assigned elements. Uh, so then, uh, what, once you define uh, all of these. Uh, then we need to um, you switch into the preprocessor mode here. Uh, then uh, you need to actually define uh, the load that, that comes from each tendon. So you do that uh, with your uh, tendon pre-stress, where you define your tendon pre-stress load. Uh, you have a load case name uh, for each of uh, the groups of tendons that you'll be activating, as well as a load group name. Uh, the load group uh, name comes into play uh, for construction staging, which typically you're always going to use for post-tension structure because you need to 
I'll look at the time dependent uh, effects of concrete. So uh, you, you can see then for each uh, for each tendon that you define, uh, which again has a tendon property associated with it, uh, then you you select which load case and which load group it is associated with, and you select. Uh, I think this is a continuity tendon we're looking at, which was stressed from both ends. So then you select uh, whether it's a single end or double end stressing, and what your uh, initial stressing is uh, at each end. And then when they're grouted, then you just add this into your tendon pre-stress load. So at this point, once you've gone through this process, you have uh, three uh, so different things defined. You have your individual tendon properties, which is thing one. Uh, your uh, tendon profiles for all each of your different post-tensioning tendons, which is thing two, and then uh, thing three is your uh, tendon pre-stress loadings associated with each tendon. Uh, so, uh, so that so then you have that, and uh, but then. There are a couple other things uh, we need to set up uh, to, to do the full uh, construction uh, post-tensioning analysis. Uh, the first is since uh, with post-tension concrete, uh, we need to have uh, you know time, uh, the time-dependent characteristics of our analysis defined. So uh, the like the the really three uh, time-dependent aspects are uh, pre-shrinkage. Pre and then a time-dependent change of uh, compressive strength of concrete. And MIDAS uses this information to then uh, calculate, uh, do the, you know, the long-term loss calculations that are associated with these tendons. Uh, so you need to define a, a time-dependent material for each uh, element in the bridge that ha in your structure that has uh, time-dependent properties associated with it. So typically, this is going to be every element that is a, so that has a post tensioning tendon in it. So uh, Midas gives you a uh, cho choices of you know different uh, different design codes to use for this. Uh, you know CEB FIP 1990 is a popular one. 1978 is a popular one. So there there are lots of different choices. Uh, so you would uh, define your compressive strength of concrete, relative humidity, the notional size of the member. Uh, Normal or rapid hardening cement age of concrete at uh, beginning of shrinkage, and then uh, you also uh, the, the so that that this definition right here covers you for uh, creep and shrinkage time dependent properties. Uh, then the second one is uh, you define uh, your compressive uh, your time dependent compressive strength of concrete. Uh, so then you want to use whatever code you used for uh, creep and shrinkage to Keep things uh, consistent, and they they give you uh, what they, they ask you what your your 28 day strength is there, and that uh, this becomes pretty important for uh, how old what the age of the concrete is when it first sees the post tensioning force. Because the younger the age of the concrete is, the uh, the more the, the higher your initial creep will be, and then typically the larger your uh, the, the losses will be too. Uh, so that that's an important parameter. Then, so once we've defined uh, creep and uh, our, our creep and shrinkage compressive strength uh, parameters, uh, then we have to associate all of the time to all of the uh, materials that we've defined that we want to have time dependent properties. We have to associate them. Uh, with these time dependent properties we've defined, and that that's done with the time dependent uh, material uh, link right here. So you can see under the properties ribbon, there's the material link. That's that's where you do it. Uh, so it's a pretty easy, uh, it's a pretty easy dialog box. You just uh, for you know for each material, just select each material one at a time, or if you have the same properties for for multiple ones, just some of them with that notional size of the uh, member dependence. You you want to find different uh, properties for ones that have different sizes. So that, that's how you can end up with uh, you know different different properties associated with the different ones. Uh, but so uh, you, you define your materials one at a time, associate your creep shrinkage uh, 
definition and your compressive strength definition with it and just move it over there and say add modify uh, and then uh, it is in the program. So at this point, once you've done those things, you'll have uh, defined uh, your, your tendon profile in space, uh, your tendon property, uh, your tendon pre-stress force, and uh, you'll use these uh, defined uh, use time-dependent materials uh, that are associated with, with each of the uh, materials for the different uh, ele different concrete elements in your model, uh, which you know some of these may have different strengths. Like our, our arch ribs were like a higher strength than say uh, the the base of the arch, uh, so that that will vary. Uh, but so now that we've all these things uh, defined, then we can begin defining our uh, we can begin defining our construction staging uh, that will then allow Midas to to calculate all the uh, to calculate the, the pre-stressing forces and and creep and shrinkage effects and all that kind of stuff. So uh, if you if you look in the construction stage generator here, uh, we were pretty we took a pretty conservative approach and defined a lot of different construction stages where you can see at the very end here it opens to traffic and then under days after and then after long-term losses and the future wearing surface, but, you know, it goes just step by step. So, you know, here, you know, the very first step is to build the pier bases and span three, and then the uh, Ray, let me display the supports so you can see those. Uh, and, the, and then the yellow one means we have a foundation spring to find. Um, the little green ones are rigid, and then you can just see that the uh, so we just we build this step by step. We pour the closure pour. Uh, we pour this post activate the post tensioning in that step. Uh, put uh, activate the crown segment, but they're still on temporary supports. Uh, place the uh, the closure pour between the crown segment and the gun segments. Then remove those temporary supports, and then activate the uh, continuity tendons. So. Uh, let's take a closer look at each of those steps so you can see how they're set up in the construction stage generator here. So in the, uh, the construction stage generator, uh, it's composed of construction stage. It is three tabs uh, where you just you, you, you tell the program what elements you're activating in each stage or deactivating, as the case may be, uh, what boundary conditions you're activating or deactivating, and then uh, what uh, what uh, load groups you're activating or deactivating. These load groups, they're different uh, than load cases. The load cases, like each load group should be associated with a load case, but you define loadings, you apply loadings in, a con in the construction staging with a load group rather than a load case. So say for, so, the, so this very first stage, we're activating the, the pier bases and the main piers, we're uh, saying at like, what age the concrete is assumed to be when they're first seeing load, when the forms are removed. Uh, then we're activating the boundary conditions that are present at that time. Uh, these are all through activated through boundary groups. So you'll, when these boundary conditions are created in the model, you'll have assigned a group to them. And then uh, they can be activated and deactivated in the construction stage composer. And then uh, here's the the load group that we're activating. We're just turning self weight on. Uh, so so then when we get to the next step here, uh, you can see now we're activating that arch segment A. And this is important. You can see we have an age of 90 days when it's activated. We had 90 day aging requirement on the uh, project where these precast segments were needed to be 90 days old before before they were erected onto the arch to uh, just to reduce the effects of creep and shrinkage. So that that's that the first 90 days is when a lot of that happens. So uh, the age uh, the age of your elements is important uh, for these time dependent effects. So you'll need to uh, you'll need to define it correctly. Uh, so then for the load at this point, you can see we've uh, activated the temporary supports uh, that the uh, that we we've act the temporary support that the uh, end segment is on has been activated as well as uh, the Pan 3 Construction A uh, is a boundary group associated with uh, temporary beam end release. It's just a, a hinge, temporary hinge connection between the uh, end segment and the base. And then uh, for the load, there's just a small uh, 
load that's applied due to the uh, the sort of a uh, pedestal that then the the spandrel column sits on, which is not included in the uh, cross section of the of the, el of the elements that we're activating. So that additional load is just point load that's defined there as a load group. Uh, so then uh, the uh, segment B activated. This isn't super exciting. We've just uh, you can see that segment B is activated. Uh, additional uh, boundary groups associated with it, uh, as well as just that uh, dead load due to the pedestal. Then in the uh, closure pores uh, made between those segments and the peer base. Uh, so uh, uh, in this case, well, this is the first uh, step of it. So uh, in, I, guess I, think, I think actually the closure pore is made in the previous stage. In this stage, now that the Closure pore is made. There's no longer a pin connection between the end segment and the base, peer base. So then those uh, beam end releases, which have these group names, are then deactivated. Common with you know sequentially staged uh, constructed post tension structures. Uh, you'll you know the structural configuration changes, and, and those temporary supports get get removed at appropriate times. Uh, so then uh, looking at our post tensioning, how that works. Uh, there are no new elements and boundaries in these stages, just the application of the post tensioning. And that's done by having created these tendon uh, pre stress loads. So these are the post tensioning that's a tendon pre stress load that we, we previously defined, and, and that's applied here. And you can see, you know, for each of these steps, we're also defining durations so that the time of the construction sequence and days uh, should be. Uh, you know, approximately what we're expecting here. Now, like the construct contractor's construction engineer is going to make their own time-dependent model too. But just for design purposes, you want to get a do something that's reasonable here, so we know there is a way uh, with reasonable construction durations to uh, design and erect the bridge with you know reasonable pre-stress losses and, and creep and shrinkage. So let's take a look. Uh, let's go into the post processor mode and just take a look at how uh, how we can how we can look at our forces. So you're, when you switch into post processor mode up here, it defaults it defaults by putting you in post CS. But we want to see we want to look at the construction stages. So for step six, that's the first stage uh, that the post tensioning is applied. So we can take a look at uh, take a look at our uh, our forces we're concerned about at this time. You can look at uh, this, again, this 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 is going to tell you uh, this model is set up to tell you dead load and pre post tensioning forces. If you were interested in wind loads uh, on this during construction, you could uh, apply those either in a post in the post CS mode and stop the model at this stage, or just apply those in another model and super pose them. So let's talk about the different uh, load components that you have during construction. Uh, so your dead load, that's just uh, the dead load is uh, the member self weight that you activate as a load group, uh, plus any additional loadings that you activate that are not specified as uh, erection loads. Uh, you can specify a limited number of loads, uh, additional loads, uh, to be erection loads, uh, which can be helpful for like temp temporary construction equipment or other things which have a different load factor. Uh, so here you can see the moment diagram from just the dead load. Uh, then the tendon primary load, uh, that is the moment uh, both and well and axial port, uh, but it, I, let's talk about it in terms of moment. That that is uh, the pre-stressing moment at the product of the uh, the pre-stressing force times p times the net eccentricity of the tendon e. Uh, so it's it's always just p times e. Uh, based on the eccentricity of the tendon you define, and you can see in this case, it's ex since the eccentricity of the tendon is constant, but then the tendon deviates, uh, uh, changes, you know, switches sides. Uh, it's, it's on the top of the, of the segment at the end and on the bottom uh, up towards the crown. So then that tendon primary moment changes orientation. Uh, but the uh, total, but then the tendon secondary moment. That uh, that's a secondary pre-stressing moment. So that that's not p times e. 
this is an additional moment that is created just by uh, the restraint of the system uh, from the, the pre-stressing force, the, the pre-stressing, the primary moments trying to uh, get the system to deform one way, but if it's not, as a system, please statically determinant uh, system, will be there will be some restraint uh, on that uh, deformation, and that restraint leads to additional moments, uh, which are here called the secondary moments, which is you know, industry standard. Uh, so then the total pre-stressing moments to some of the primary and secondary moments. Uh, then you can see uh, Midas will tell you uh, your creep at each instruction stage step. Uh, that's creep secondary. You always want to use uh, for your creep and shrinkage forces uh, creep secondary and and shrinkage secondary. Uh, the, the, you, you see there are these options for creep primary and shrinkage primary at the bottom. Uh, but th those are just like forces Midas applies to get the uh, correct uh, creep uh, and shrinkage uh, effects in the model. Uh, so then what we did for our design is for each of the construction stages we had, we were interested in, uh, we just used the results tables to, to pull out these forces. Uh, say if we were interested in arch segment A, um, we, we could pull out whichever one, one of these forces we wanted, and then it would give us this table, uh, which typically we had in Gipsy. And then uh, we just paste this into, uh, copy and paste this into our uh, Excel post-processing spreadsheet, which also had the uh, all the you know the section properties for the ribs and the post we're in the post-processing spreadsheet. So then we could do uh, our stress and strength design checks in that post-processing spreadsheet using uh, these output forces at each step you were interested. In. Okay, so that that's just an overview of how of the the bridge itself and how it's all set up in Midas. And I think it looks like we have a little time for questions. This, People are interested in asking questions. Uh, thanks, Daniel. Uh, it was indeed a great presentation. Uh, we are very impressed. And uh, yeah, there are questions coming from uh, the attendees. Actually, lots of questions. Uh, but oh, since our time uh, is <laughs> since our time is limited, uh, no, they're they're like uh, just really interested in how you uh, do stuff. Uh, so let's uh, maybe answer three questions at most, and I can forward the rest of the questions uh, to you, uh, if you don't mind. Yeah, yeah, no problem. I'll, if you forward them to me, I'll try to answer them before Thanksgiving. All right, yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, do you, uh, are you able to see my screen right now? Yeah. Yep. Okay, the PowerPoint, right? Yep, yep. Okay. Uh, Okay, so let me see. The first, the first question I see here is, I want to ask about the truck live load distribution factor for the arches. Uh, did you calculate it from the model, and then you compare against the the ASHTO distribution? Uh, the well, the ASH, uh, for the arches, uh, the, the distribution of factors in ASHTO LRFD section four aren't applicable to those uh, because, like the arches are supporting spandrel columns, which are supporting uh, floor beams, which then support the uh, pre-stressed girders. So those, the, the distribution factors would be applicable to those pre-stressed girders, but not, not really anything below it. Uh, so what we did do is just using the transverse section, we used the lever rule to find the uh, live load distribution factor uh, to each arch line, which is a, a similar, that, that approach is I mean, often taken for both trusses and arches. And we did do, as I recall, we did do a little comparison with our 3D model that we were intending uh, to just basically use only for wind loads. But we found that what we calculated using the lever rule was, uh, which which was good. That because I mean, this model with all this construction staging takes a while to run, and it's pretty complex to set up with all these different tendon paths, with all this geometry, and it was much simpler. Uh, to model this with a line analysis, a two D line analysis, than it would have been to do the uh, stage post tensioning in a three D model where there where there are four different arch lines. So that lever rule, uh, live load distribution, really uh, helped simplify things a lot for us. Uh, okay, uh, that helps clarify that. Uh, the second question here is: Is it possible to design such arch structures with only concentric? Post tensioning, uh, it, 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 it certainly could be. I mean, ideally, I, I feel for arch 
structures. To me, the ideal arch structure has sufficiently rigid uh, spring line supports and sufficiently close spandrel columns that you don't need any uh, that you don't need any post tensioning and just the natural compressive thrust in the arch uh, gives you the strength you need and ability to resist bending moments. So. Um, I, I think for an arch that maybe had close, more closely spaced spandrel columns or perhaps uh, more rigidly, uh, more rigid piers, you might, uh, de depending on how rigid everything was and how close the columns were, maybe you would only need concentric post tensioning or maybe you wouldn't need post tensioning at all, ideally, and that there'd just be enough impressive uh, thrust in, in the arch to not exceed any stress limit if you're using a, a precast elements as, as we were. Now, if the whole thing was cast in place, then uh, those the service stress limits, uh, I mean, depending on your design criteria, might, might not even apply. Uh, OK. Uh, the, the next question is, uh, OK, if uh, the 2D model is used for design, did you calculate live load distribution factors, and how did you take into account uh, the live load eccentricity that creates moment in the columns and the arch? Uh, so that, uh, we, we did, again, use that. Uh, the lever rule did give us some eccentricity. We also uh, did make use of our 3D model to figure out how much uh, torsion from live load eccentricity, like we'll say live load up on the sidewalk or, or otherwise, how, how much torsion uh, would go into our arch system from that. Uh, the arch at each spandrel column does uh, feature uh, cross tracing between the different arch columns, uh, between the different arch lines, and we found that the, the closed system formed by the, the pier cap plus the spandrel columns on the side, and then plus those the arch racing elements connecting each arch line. That that closed system enables the whole the whole thing to uh, resist torsion a lot better than if those bottom braces were not there. Uh, so that that was the finding that we got out of our our three D model. But so we really did from from the investigations we did using three uh, D to to look at torsion uh, plus lever rule uh, that gave us uh, conservative results and simplified the design quite a lot. Uh, then was the original bridge load rated? Uh, I I do not recall if it had a close load rating. I think the uh, the deterioration was so. Ex that just by inspection uh, at the time that bridge was demolished, they had closed the exterior lane uh, because the deterioration was so extensive. Uh, it's interesting that bridge, uh, like the deck slab, it had this, uh, it, it was uh, like completely fixed. The, the deck slab was completely fixed to the spandrel columns in the original arch from the 1930s. And so it, it gave that deck slab a, a, a pretty good ability to redistribute forces uh, but the the contractor did note that when they uh, began demo demolishing the bridge uh, I mean they had it, the deck slab was thick it took some effort to demolish it seemed to have a lot of strength uh, but the spandrel columns had a lot of deterioration and some of them were hollow to have uh, like drainage pipes in them and they said they could just dosing said they could just like get a spandrel column and it would just fall down so I think those were probably the, the weakest link and then the arches uh, were fairly robust. There was a, actually uh, the arches were imploded of the original bridge, and uh, some of the charges didn't go off, but some of them did. It's the first attempt to implode it, and uh, I think one of the arches remained remained standing uh, with a big, big gash in it. So those, those arches were actually pretty strong, but they, I mean, they looked at it and just decided it wouldn't be like cost effective from a long term durability standpoint to. Uh, the ability to reach All right, I think uh, there are still a couple more questions, but we're we're over time. Uh, so ideally, we don't want to run over time. And so, yeah, uh, as I said, uh, the questions would uh, be forwarded to Daniel, and he will try to answer them. Um, and yeah, keep in mind this session is also recorded, and uh, we will. Uh, send you the recording on uh, next Monday because it takes some time for the video to process. Uh, but yeah, other than that, uh, Daniel, do you have any closing notes to that you want to say to the attendees? Oh, well, well thanks everyone for, for tuning in. Uh, always enjoyed 
talking about my projects, especially this one. This might be my favorite bridge project. I mean, like you mentioned, it's an oldie but a goodie. And uh, yeah, yeah, thanks for tuning in. Thanks for your attention. Hope you found it useful. All right. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you so much, Ru. I yeah. really appreciate it. And then thanks, everyone, uh, to come. Uh, so yeah, uh, I'm just going to close the session now. And I hope everyone have a really good weekend and uh, Thanksgiving uh, and holidays. And please stay safe, stay healthy. Thanks a lot for hosting. Yeah, for the no problem. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.